but tonight we are not yet ready to move into Abraham dealing with Isaac and Ishmael. Uh, though behind me I have a chart, and um, on one side it lists the prodigal, and the other side it lists the elder son, and then Isaac, and then Ishmael, and then Jacob, and then Esau, and then Joseph, and then I started to, just to make it shorter, his bros, but I decided we'll go with his brothers. Uh, so, um, when it comes to not just the scriptures, because a lot of times we, we think in terms of the scriptures, but when it comes to the eternal God and the way he works and the way he views, do I need to stop? I can. Okay. Then I'll just drink anyway. Um, his plan works through two sons. Now we we here who are been here a long time and are most spiritual will automatically think in terms of Adam and Christ. And while that is while that is a huge thing in relationship to his dealing um, early on, um, as time passes, the Lord wants to deal with us um, by two other sons, if you will. And um, so just so you know, the, the two sons of Luke 15 in the prodigal son story, the prodigal son and the older son, at the beginning of that story, First of all, it's not referring to them as, as um, Adam or Christ. That's not who they represent. Um, there are two sons there, but both of those sons are Adam and at the beginning of the story. Both of them are, are, even though they're in the family of God, their nature and the way that they proceed the thoughts that they have and the attitudes that come are um, not just Adam, but not the son. And I think that's important. I think it's important that we grasp uh, that in that manner. You say, well, I don't see much difference. Well, the difference is, is that we're we are saying it's Adam, but we're not admitting that Christ has not yet been formed in those areas. Um, while it, it, in this way, it can be said that they are no longer <coughs> in Adam. Because that's true. If they're sons and they're in the family, they are no longer in Adam. Absolutely. Praise God. But while we have been placed in Christ, the Father, the Father is after his son. And, and uh, there's, there's a missing son in our lives. There's a missing son. And this is, this is where I wanted to draw the chart, talk about this missing son. Another way of putting it is, um, well, before I get to that, I'll, I'll just say, that this, there is a son that is missing. And in the story of the prodigal son, when you had two sons, neither one of them in, in, the, in the most real way were in Adam. Neither one. They were born again, and they were in the family. They were the father's sons. They were his. Um, but there was a son missing. There was a son that that the father desired. And you, you remember I spent much time on the prodigal son story, so I'm sure you're, you've had almost enough of this, but it is important, I think, to see this from the father's perspective because the father is, is um, um, stable. He is, um, has assurance that we are no longer in Adam. 
but we are in Christ. But he does not see his missing son. He does not see him in the elder son, and he does not see him in the early stages of the prodigal son. Now the question is, is this the son we're speaking of, is he in both of those sons? Yeah, he has to be. He has to be. So we're not talking about heaven or hell. We're not talking about Adam or Christ. We're talking about the father's heart. We're talking about his heart toward his son. Um, uh, I, I wrote this, while God reveals his plan over and over through scripture by the use of two sons, his focus is on one son. And in many cases, this one son is the invisible son, the invisible son. So let's do a little rehearsing with the prodigal son story. And let's, let's see how um, probably both sons, before the prodigal even left, their heart was somewhat towards the father. Uh, I believe that back then, particularly, there were, um, you know, even 40, 50 years ago, it used to be an honor to have uh, Johnson and sons, you know, his, the person, the father, and have his sons working with him. And it was an honor, and, and they loved putting that uh, after the father's last name. Um, but what they were doing was not presenting back to the father the son that was in them, the invisible son. In fact, he was very invisible because the father didn't see him. But he was missing from the equation. Um, you can call it the family spirit was not there, the family spirit. The family was there but not the family spirit. And we see this on a lower level a lot of times around Christmas time and we go and we're with our family and we notice that, <laughs> you know, there's a different spirit than maybe what we have or several of us in the family compared to others. Um, well, this is even on a higher plane because whatever that is was is a shadow um, compared to the bright shining of the father's desire for his missing son. He is missing his son because the son is missing from the family. Uh, but the father fathered them into the family with that son, born again of incorruptible seed. Well, that's not us. Incorruptible seed is Christ. Uh, so, um, so the prodigal, as I've stated, probably, I mean, there's several different angles of him, but um, he probably thought, I'm going to go out and I'm going to make something of myself to the glory of the Father. And, the, and, you know, where I get that from, and this may not prove it to you and it may not be true, but where I get that idea from is when he comes back, his words are, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Okay, so this seems like a, a, a trick to become more worthy to the father. And in his trick, he found out, I'm not that son. I'm not the son. I, I am a son, but I'm not worthy to be called a son because somehow he knew that there was something higher, even if he didn't ever attain it to that point, he knew that there was something greater in the Father's heart. And so um, with the elder son, he probably stayed. He probably stayed and said, I will faithfully work the fields for my father. And that's where he was when the prodigal came back, in the fields, working for the father and giving his best. Um, but when, 
when the prodigal returned, as we've discussed, the father treated him completely different than what he should have been treated as a son. He should have been treated as no more worthy. All right, so we read that story, and many people just attribute to it. This is the grace of God. This is the God of second chances. You know, okay, let's just write that on the chalkboard of our mind. The God of second chances, and then beside it, let's write the father and the son of his love. Which is more important? You know. Uh, the God of second chances is all about us and God. God. But the other storyline is about a father who apparently was a father before the foundation of the world, who apparently wanted an increase. Because he already had his son. You can't say well, he just wanted his son because he already had that before the foundation of the world. You can't, you can't just say that. You, you must look at the scriptures, and like in Colossians or, or John the Baptist, he must increase and I must decrease. You begin to realize that God, the Father, wants an increase of his son, and he's chosen to put him in us, earthen vessels. Um, all right, so an earthen vessel will never become anything more than an earthen vessel in that sense. Uh, maybe we'll get a glorified body and it'll, you know, everybody will look young. I guess that's what the whole idea is, huh? You know, we'll all look young and beautiful. Or maybe Christ will shine out of everybody and we won't even be seen because the glory of him, I mean, that would be cool. <laughs> I would vote for that, <laughs> you know. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, what if, what if God said, okay, you know, when you all die and you all go to heaven, I'm going to make you young and you all look like you did in high school. Would you be okay with that? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't specify what young meant or... I could really say a lot more along those lines, but I'm a gentleman and a scholar. Or not. <laughs> or not. Stop. Okay, so, um, so God's focus, when the prodigal came back and said, I am no longer worthy to be called thy son, the father seemed to be overjoyed because when the realization hits us that, you know, there is absolute, I mean, and I know when this hit me from the Lord at a certain walk in my life, there is nothing I can do that can measure up to what the son is in the father's heart. And therefore, the greater gift I can give him is his son. You know, um, before that, we're like little children. And that's what it says, you know, that um, in the last couple of verses in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, when you became mature, you put away childish things. But a, a child will go, oh, I know this makes you happy, you know. And it does because of the state of their heart. But it is still not given him his son. There's still, if, can I say that again? There's a missing son in the equation, a missing son. And who would miss him the most, you or the father? The father would. Um, and so the prodigal, uh, as you know, and as I've shared many times, begins to notice in the father's heart and the father's tone and the father's actions He's treating him like he's, you know, been the best son in the whole world, right? The signet ring, the, you know, the robe, uh, all, all of that, as we have and will see um, throughout. For example, Joseph in the many-colored robe, coat of many colors, 
representing the Father's pleasure, representing the firstborn, on and on and on. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theme. It works in, in all these stories on some level. <coughs> and so um, this, this treatment, all of a sudden, maybe the Father had done it all along. Who knows? Maybe he just didn't notice because he was so full of himself. You know what I mean? I'm no longer worthy to be a son, so maybe I thought I was worthy to be something. You see what I mean? I'm, uh, maybe the father was bestowing the invisible son that was in him honor and grace and glory, uh, and he took it to himself. This is, this is all about me, you know. God loves me because I'm and I'm saved and I'm, you know, on my way to glory. Um, but at this point, when he is convinced, like Romans seven has its way of doing, he's convinced that I'm no longer wor worthy. Oh wretched man that I am, who, you start looking somewhere else. The father wants to present the. The missing son but he is really in truth the present son but he is the invisible present son he's there he's in him he's in the elder son but he's missing but present and so um, the father takes him through the altar through the process, through the slainness of the son that he's referring to, through the givenness, through the, the to be able to see the beauty of sacrifice. But it's really the beauty of the nature of the lamb who will be sacrificed. And every lamb before this lamb was a far cry. Even if it was innocent, it was not, um, it probably wasn't willing, saying I'm willing. It didn't fight against it, but it didn't, you know, wasn't a willing sacrifice in the, in the manner of the Lamb of God because he's doing it for the Father and, yes, for us, but for us that, that the Father would get his son in us. Isn't that funny? for us that the Father would get his Son out of us, that he put in us. And so um, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, if you'll turn there with me. The scriptures I'm going to start with here is um, um, talking about Moses. also backed off a little bit because I feel okay for those who are listening to this it's the, the recording is going to be better <laughs> in case you're leaning up against your you know or I can't hear this guy I know that I'm speaking a lot softer than normal too I know I'm, it's, it should be good isn't it or do I need to talk louder? Thank you. I like. I would like to tell you that is Shay speaking sweetly to me right now, because they can see me on the camera. <laughs> okay, Hebrews eleven. Did I say that? Okay, let's begin with verse twenty-five, and this is speaking of Moses. I want you to carefully listen, not with what you've known, but with what maybe what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to us. Choosing rather to suffer. <clears throat> Choosing rather to suffer. Uh, you know, what does that sound like? It sounds like the lamb. 
Okay. But it's but it is the lamb in his story, in Moses' story. And this is what we want in us. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Okay, so this is assuming that the people of God <coughs> um, will not just necessarily be enjoying everything in life and being blessed and everything as some picture <coughs> the people of God, but rather they will be going through things, sufferings and afflictions that they choose. All right, so let's just qualify that then. There are afflictions that just come and there are afflictions that we choose because of Christ, because we want to um, fellowship with him in his sufferings, for example, or be made conformable to his death. Folks, those afflictions uh, will not come to someone who, uh, they will just come as affliction to someone who does not want to be conformed to the image of the Lamb. They won't. They, they, it'll, they'll just be trials, life's trials. But, but to those, all these things are working together to conform them to this son. And that's what it says, to be made conformable uh, to his son. Um, so, um, so there's a choosing, rather, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. <clears throat> okay, sin is missing the mark, and the real mark is what? Salvation. No, it's Christ. The real mark is Christ. All have sinned and come short of the real mark, the glory of God. Christ in you, the glory of God. Christ in you, the hope of the glory of God. And missing the mark of that, <clears throat> um, and verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, the reproach of Christ, greater riches. It is, it is if I'm reproached, well, how about this? Now, under these circumstances, if this is your story, like it was Moses's and like it was Jesus' story, then it is not your reproach that you're, you're, you're falling under. You can be with Christ in that. Even if, you've, even if you failed, the prodigal son miserably failed. And he made a move from it being about him to about the Lord. And you can see things in light of, you can see it in light of Jesus. You see everything in light of Jesus. You, you, are, you are swallowed up of, of his heart and his nature. And, his, um, and when we say his nature, it is the heart of the lamb. It is the heart of the lamb. You know, is that valuable? Well, I mean, my God, look all through human history and look at the Mayans and look at all of this where they would cut somebody open and sacrifice a human sacrifice and they would take his heart out and hold it up like this. Am I right or wrong? And this is the, this is the heart is the heart of the issue. And it is the thing, and they, it will, by whatever understanding they have, even though it's not the true depth of Christ, they understand that God wants the heart of the thing. So we say, well, God wants our heart. Well, that's, that's true, but, you know, it is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? So what heart is he after? His heart in us. I will give you a new heart. This is the new covenant, folks. This isn't anything new. <laughs> this, is, this is what we've all believed in when we first got saved and said oh praise God I love the new covenant you know so um, esteeming the reproach of Christ not esteeming suffering for suffering's sake man the big difference the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt Okay, clearly God will have to do something in us to get us to that place, right? But the first, our first thing, like the prodigal son, is to notice, I think I stepped back from here again, I'm so sorry. I think I uh, um, noticed that the prodigal son didn't know it going in either. 
and he began to be brought in by the Father. You know, you're not going to be brought in by your understanding. You're not. You're, all the study in the scriptures possibly could just make you a Pharisee. You know, a, a, a crucifier of Jesus, the Lamb. Or you can be led by the Father and taught by the Spirit of God concerning their heart. Because before the world, there wasn't Ten Commandments. There wasn't, you know, I mean... I didn't go into it enough, but out of Exodus, I can show you the Ten Commandments were God's reaction to those who rebelled against being firstborn, who were slated for sacrifice. All right. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Okay, so he's what is the re reward here? Is it saying greater riches? He gave that up. You know, I mean, that's what we will. I'll go through this as long as I get something in the end. You, you know, what you're going to get is a nature as, good, as a person who is a certain way who will always be that way. We will never convert Jesus to Christianity. I know, this is why I'm in trouble all the time. He doesn't want to be a Christian. He wants to be the Lamb of God. And he wants to be the Son Lamb to the Father. That's what he wants to do, you know. And he never said, you know, he walked this earth, with, you know, 33 years and said, you know, I, I need to go. I need to get back to the epicenter of religion which is in heaven. He said, I go to my father. I go to my father. So greater than a religion is a father-son relationship. And beloved, now are you called the sons of God, but it does not yet, even though you're called that, does not yet appear what you shall be. But when he appears, you shall be like him. My God, I mean, isn't that good enough? I mean, shouldn't we have just all clapped? Yeah. <laughs> I mean... How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful, how plain, you know, you know, but we are hard of hearing in so many ways, aren't we? I mean, we are, and the disciples were too. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured to see in him who is invisible. <coughs> All right. So the prodigal needed to see him who was in him, who is, was invisible to him at that point. But it clearly he began to not, no longer be invisible from the father's eyes and heart. He could see that that son, but he could see that that son was in him. You see what I mean? When you look into Jesus' face, you're changed from glory to glory into that same image. Well, in this case, he was looking into the father's face and seeing the son of his love. <clears throat> So he forsook Egypt and all of the glory and honor it brought him, um, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. The thing that moved him from the thing that everybody is after, which is riches and fame and glory and, you know, all this stuff and acclaim uh, is... He saw him who is invisible. And the thing that moved the prodigal son from being a, pro a son, and that, beloved, now you're called the sons of God, but you're a prodigal until he appears. The thing that moved him from being a prodigal unto the, the invisible son recognizing that invisible son within was a recognition of what was in the Father's heart and was a recognition that the Father without words is saying, there's another son in me that the Father deeply desires. And I haven't seen this, this I haven't seen my Father this happy 
since the elder son was born, actually. No, just, <laughs> of course, he wasn't around then. So, <clears throat> uh, seeing him who is invisible through faith, he kept the Passover. Well, isn't that funny that that's the very next word? The very ne you don't even finish this in the very next sentence. Him who is invisible, for he kept the Passover, and and Moses functioned as a firstborn, and God said, "Let my son go." I know it's branded in our minds, "Let my people go," but the first time he said it was, "Let my son, my firstborn son." Go, that he may come unto me in, and in sacrifice and a feast of that sacrifice that the prodigal went to the altar with the father and ate the sacrifice and they rejoiced. And, and, and tr transformation takes place in that realm. Transformation takes place there. We want to be transformed. I mean, come on. What a glorious thing to be transformed. I mean, Changed is one thing. Transformed is another one. <clears throat> and if I remember correctly, that is the word uh, metamorphosis. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And it's transformation from, you know, you say, well, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Well, actually, you're transformed from a dead cocoon to a living life that can fly, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> and he flies unto the Father. Um, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So he's, he's like, this is, the, this, is, this is the salvation of the firstborn. I mean, both are but when he says he kept the Passover, when Israel kept the Passover, they, for many years after that, didn't put blood on the doorpost because that wasn't the Passover. That was the thing that kept those who were not firstborn from dying, the blood. on the. But for the firstborn, it was the death of you read it, you study it, study it. You, sh you need to know this inside and out. The, f the lamb died for the firstborn of Israel and all firstborn, and Egypt's firstborn died because the lamb had not died and had not been partaken of, and yes, then the blood. But it was all about the firstborn, firstborn lamb, the firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn of Israel, and God saying, I want my firstborn out of you. You know, let him go. Stop holding him back and being whatever you think is right. And so, all right. So, what time is it? Romans 1, let's turn there. Chapter 1. I think I may need to pick it up. <laughs> No clue how fast I'm going here. <laughs> how much? You are a blessing. <laughs> I didn't know this was going to be about math. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 17. <clears throat> For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith that is written, the just shall live by faith. All right, so the righteousness of God is that the justified live by faith. Okay? For therein is the righteousness of God, and it's revealed from faith to faith because the just are going to live from one level of faith to another in relationship to the Lord. Yes, we start out with he's our savior, and then maybe we find out he's our healer, our blesser, or Holy Ghost giver, or whatever. But we ultimately, uh, Abraham's faith, when it says, when it quotes 
what God said to Abraham, the just shall live by faith and that you were justified by faith, it was that he believed in a son was going to come forth and that that son uh, was going to be Galatians 3.16. How's that go again? What? Yeah, which seed is Christ? It is, he saith, not unto seeds as of many, but unto one. And that seed is Christ for all generations. It is the firstborn, and it is the invisible son that is supposed to run right through all of these. Because he's always there. He's always present, but he may be missing, but he's always present. And, but though he's present, he is invisible until we see him. Okay, so for the wrath of God is revealed. So first of all, the righteousness of God is revealed, but now the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Okay, so the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Okay, so what is that? When the heavenly reality that Christ is it hits us, it is, it is that's the end of us. Okay, that is the end of us as in, that, in that way. I mean, obviously, we still have our personality. We still have all of that. And, God's fine with that, but he wants his son in the life of his son where he, we can live by this faith Amen. of this, the son. And um, <clears throat> against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, and here's the problem, see, who hold the truth and unrighteousness. This isn't talking about people who just rank bad, yucky sinners. They're truth holders. But they're not holding the truth as the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. And <laughs> Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? You know, I remember in the 60s when Jimi Hendrix was on stage playing and, and he was going through some stuff. And he said, you know, um, uh, oh, oh, somebody yelled out, tell us the truth, Jimmy. And he was talking, and he's, Jimmy looked at him, at him and he said, what is the truth? Well, we need to know. But once we begin to know, we can't hold that in unrighteousness in a way that promotes us, in a way that makes us something, in a way that is, because uh, I've seen people with, who've claimed to have a revelation of Christ and they use it as a badge of honor instead of getting getting low. They use it as, you know, well, I know more than you do, or I, you know, this and that. And oh my God, that is the exact opposite of Christ revealed. Um, verse nineteen, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. For the invisible things of Him, okay. It's talking about not the invisible things of creation, but from creation, from before creation, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, except the seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. You can see it there, but you don't, you don't see him who is invisible. You can see his eternal power and his Godhead. You can see, you know, but, but the invisible thing, the thing that is invisible, you're not seeing in fullness. You're seeing in shadow form. We see in a, a glass darkly. But then what? Face to face. Well, face to face means what? Changed into that same image. It always goes back to him. It always does. So, uh, so that they are without excuse because that, when the, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they th thankful, but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. Okay, so the problem was they knew God, but they didn't glorify him as the God that he is. 
okay? It, it's not just saying, you're God, you're God. I mean, the pagans, the whole world is full of pagan worship that said, you're God, we're worshiping you as God, even if, even if it's pointed at the right God. Israel is a perfect example. They had the right God. They just didn't know the God that they had. Does that make sense? I mean, they had the correct God, but they didn't worship him as the God that he is. All right, so Colossians chapter 1. Starting with verse 12. Colossians 1, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father. Giving thanks, come on. Where's that coming from? From a son. <clears throat> giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us fit to be partakers of the, what? Well, who gets the inheritance? The firstborn son. The inheritance of the saints in light. The saints that are in light. Okay, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son or the kingdom of the son of his love is the better translation of that. Okay, so what happened? It doesn't say who saved us from hell. I mean, yes, we've been delivered from the power of darkness, but we have not been delivered from the presence of darkness. The, the devil doesn't have any right to have power over us. Did you know that? He doesn't have any right. That's, he's a trespasser on that front. But God didn't deliver us from his presence because God still uses him. All right? So, um, who hath delivered us from the power of God and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. So it is not a kingdom of like uh, what the... Knights of the Round Table, you know. It is not all that kind of stuff. You know, well, oh, I want to be Lancelot. You know, you know. how about you just be Jesus and get low, you know. Uh, it's, besides, it's not the kingdom of Lancelot. It's the kingdom of the son of his dear love. The son of his love. The son of his dear, dear son. Um, in whom we have redemption. So here we go. Now listen to this. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God. Okay, so it just barely throws in there, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins, but it's in the son of his love. It's not in the Savior. To the, to the Father, it's, this wasn't done by the Savior. I mean, is that important? Yes. Well, it is to the Father. It is extremely important to the Father. And yet we, we live down here and we go, well, my Savior saved me from my sins and all that. And that's, I mean, in the early stages, every one of us do that, and it's just fine. But we're no longer children. We're supposed to grow up and find what is the heart of the Father and what's in his heart pertaining to his Son. So... Um, uh, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God. There he is. He is the image of the invisible. So in all of this, on the chart on the board, whether it be the prodigal or elder, the Ishmael or Isaac or Jacob or Esau or Joseph or his brothers, there's a father who supposedly fathered them beyond the earthly fathers who was invisible and they never knew the father, much less the son. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Okay. Um, <clears throat> who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. Oh my God. So, these guys on this, on the left side of the chart up here, prodigal, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they're not the firstborn. There's an invisible son in each and every one of them, in each and every one of us, who is meant to be the firstborn. And we need to quit grabbing the scriptures and applying them to us as if we're the firstborn. 
we need to give way. We need to let the firstborn go unto the Father out of us. To, to no longer hold him back with our doctrines and desires. Um, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and in, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Okay, so there are many realities of his heart that are invisible yet to us. But he's the firstborn of it. Okay. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Is there any question that Jesus is supposed to be the firstborn? Amen. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, you see that? He is the head of the body, that in all things he might have the preeminence. the firstborn from the dead, Amen. that in all things he might have preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. All right, so the Father is never going to see anyone else as the firstborn. And so when I talk about it, when I share that, or when anytime I say anything about the firstborn, like uh, um, uh, Isaac was the firstborn or whatever, uh, uh, in truth, it is Christ in him, the invisible Son in him. Okay, so, um, so imagine, so imagine that Moses was, he was the firstborn, and so let's imagine that he thinks he's going to get all this, so he does, and he ends up, because his mom blessed him and put him in a basket, and the, the daughter of Pharaoh took him in, and was, he was raised as the son of Pharaoh, not the firstborn unto the Lord, unto the Father. And, and he became great and known and pampered and blessed and everything else. But at a certain juncture, he realized him who is invisible, like the prodigal did. Him who is invisible in him. Now he's, all, all, he's seeing, so he's no longer invisible, you understand? You start seeing him, he's not invisible. You start realizing it's him, it's Christ, it's the, he is the firstborn. So then he's willing to take reproach to, to move from the place of my whole life is about this, you know. I want to I be on American Idol and, and be the number one idol. Oh, wow. Anyway. Uh, and I'm, I'm willing to be reproached for saying I'm not it. Well, do you think there's going to be an uprising about that? Well, as long as you say I'm not it, people are kind of okay, but don't turn around and say you're not it, which I do all the time. <laughs> but if, you, if a person doesn't, see him who is invisible, how can they go with that? You have, seeing him who was invisible is what the scripture declares. Okay? So, um, so the father ends up being pleased. It pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell. Okay? All right, one more scripture. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about a guy who did see him who was invisible. Are you okay with that? Yes. <clears throat> His name's Timothy. Actually, not really. It's the guy that wrote to Timothy. 1 Timothy 1, verse starting with verse 15. This is a faithful saying. Okay. <laughs> Woohoo! We've included in that this is going to be a faithful saying. You can bank on this one. And worthy of all acceptation. Meaning, we need to accept it because it's, it is a true faithful saying. That 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, okay, of whom I am chief, okay, but he came to save sinners, and Paul said, I was the chief. Why was Paul the chief sinner? Why? 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 How could, that's, that's pride if you're saying, well, if I'm a sinner, I'm the chief of them. I, if I'm a sinner, I'm the worst. Because he crucified Christ, uh, Christ, as it were, and he did it in the person of Stephen. And he realized what he did, and he realized that this guy isn't fighting, and he's not cursing, and he's not, you know, but Paul went out breathing, thank you, breathing hatred and all this junk. And he's watching this guy who's saying the same words, Jesus, Father, don't hold this to their charge. I, before I came to the Lord, I definitely was the chief of sinners, is what he's saying. I did the worst thing. I stood against the very reality that, is, that this whole thing is all about. And Stephen is acting as a firstborn, going into sacrifice in a right spirit the spirit of Christ, the spirit of the firstborn. He who is invisible is manifesting. Oh my God, glory to God. Um, uh, <clears throat> verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me, so he says, but here's why I obtained mercy. I was the worst of the worst because I did this and stood against Jesus and his body and he says, how be it for this cause I have obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth. Oh, but how? In all long suffering. Show forth in long suffering. Show forth in suffering long and doing it in the right spirit. Do you realize that long suffering doesn't mean you just suffer long? It means that you do it in a, in a right spirit, in the spirit of the Lamb. That's what it's taught. It's not long-suffering. It's just suffering long if you don't have that spirit. Well, I've been suffering for 20 years, you know. But long-suffering is the ability to go through suffering for longer than what we can hold our breath. Okay. Well, he says that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth. Jesus wants to show forth in him. <laughs> I mean, how gloriously beautiful is that? And he sees it and he understands it. He that invisible wants to be seen in me in suffering by a certain spirit for a pattern. I'm a pattern. I'm not the original that's what he's saying. I'm not the original, but the original lives in me. But this is a pattern. For a pattern to them who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. This is the pattern of life. Is that what he's saying? He didn't say uh, that Jesus Christ would show forth in me over the victory of every devil and every person who would, you know, try to put down Jesus or whatever else. No, he said, show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them who should hereafter believe on him. Believe on him in this manner to life everlasting. Verse 17, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible. Okay, so he's He's going to be around forever. It's called eternal. This spirit. Who's the king of kings and lord of lords? What's it, what's it say the, in Revelation? The lamb. For the lamb, the slaughtered lamb, is king of kings and lord of lords. Now unto the slaughtered lamb, the king eternal, immortal. You can kill him, but you can't kill him. You know what I mean? You can kill him, but you cannot end it. You know. Invisible, because they don't, you know, they know not what they do for sure. 
the only wise God, and we're talking, and if you're going to talk wisdom, and this is absolute fact, if you're going to talk wisdom in the New Testament, you have to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and get the basis for it, which is Christ crucified. The, the wisdom and the power of God is that he died and he gave himself and he poured himself out. <clears throat> Be honor and glory, okay, and the fulfillment of that is what John saw in the book of Revelation. They're all worshiping what? The lamb that rose up and has the victory. No, the lamb that was slain. To him be honor. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory and honor and power and majesty and dominion. The only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto you, son Timothy. Son Timothy. According to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So he's saying this spirit, this pattern is committed to you, Timothy. You're as a son. And this is your charge. And that there was, who knows, there could have been prophecies given to him. But I will tell you that there are plenty of prophets to read, which they didn't have a New Testament. Remember that? They didn't have a New Testament. They're reading the prophets. And they're going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Because it's always about, well, I'll let, I don't want to give away Kelly's classes. <laughs> um, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Well, I thought that was an interesting way of putting it, but it really is because you get to a certain place where things are tugging at you and pulling at you and you have to make a stand. You have to make a stand for Christ crucified. You have to make a stand for the lamb in you. You have to do that in you and you have to do that around you because if you don't, the, this, uh, you know, uh, it, it starts creeping in on you. The walls will start creeping and you've got to push those walls back and stand with the Lord. But the best way to do that is keep staying in the word and hearing from the Lord what he's saying on these things. And if you do, then You'll, have, you'll fight a good warfare against that which is fighting against Christ and him crucified. So I just wanted to read one final two, two verses, two, I mean two uh, sentences. If we accept God's redemptive work on the cross, we are called sons of God. But that part all by itself does not resemble God just receiving him as Savior, the redemption, and being called a son of God. But that part by all by itself does not resemble God except in his work. But not in Christ in us, the hope of glory, for that is an impartation of God himself. That's an impartation of God himself. Beloved, he says, and you know, you, you do understand when he's saying that to them, they're like the prodigal in the sense that they have not seen him who is invisible. And they say, and, and, and uh, John says, beloved or beloved son, you are the beloved son. It doth not yet appear what you shall be, but when he shall appear, you shall be like him. And everyone that hath this hope purifieth himself even as he is pure. Even as he is pure. So the, so the seeing of the invisible son, the hearing of John being a fatherly representation to those people, beloved sons, beloved 
you're saved, you're in the family, but it doesn't appear. The invisible firstborn, he who is invisible, does not yet appear in me. But know this. When he does appear, you'll be like him. The goal is not to be like him. The goal is for him to appear, the invisible one to no longer be invisible to us. And when he appears, we'll be like him. And those who have this hope that it, when it hasn't happened yet, every man that hath this hope purifieth himself even as he is pure because you're, you are you're changing hope. Your hope is not you. Your hope is, is him who is invisible and the, the realization or the revelation of that him in you. And then you're like him, but it's him. And all glory will go to him. All glory will go to him. Amen. Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, I pray your blessings on each one as we part ways here and many are going off to be with family in different places. Some are staying here and being with family, but it will be so easy to get our focus off of you and may our hearts never lose focus. May our desire, may we war a good fight. May we war a, 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 a fight of resistance against that which would take the light from us and we begin to doubt in darkness what we saw in light. Lord, we stand, we drive that stake in the ground and we say we're, we're with you regardless. We want to be with you regardless. And so keep your spirit of Holy Spirit moving upon us even throughout this season. And Father, in the beginning of next year, then bless the new phase of the firstborn son sharing that you have imparted uh, as we get into Abraham and that whole story. And the beauty, Lord, the incredible beauty. It's like a painting. It's like a, Lord, we look at a, a beautiful sky and we paint it, and that painting is so far from the beautiful sky. Well, the beautiful sky is so far from the beauty of the painting in your heart that I see pertaining to this story. And I pray that you'll allow it to flow and, and be painted in us. And I thank you, Father. I give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.